Dear colleagues and friends, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me jump straight away into it. We all know that the Commission or the EU is trying to set up a regulatory framework which will govern the digital economy and the digital market for the next decades. We have analyzed in our report that was commissioned by uh, Berg and of which I'm one of the authors, we have analyzed uh, the Digital Market Act, Services Act, Governance Act, uh, AI Act, Artificial Intelligence Act, not yet the, the data, but we did that later. And our conclusion is that the consumer dimension falls short. It's not taken really seriously into the analysis. And that is amazing because we, ha we are living in a consumption economy. So everything depends on us, on consumption, and consumption means growth, and so on, and so on. Luckily, I think in the end, the Commission decided to have this debate on digital fairness where, uh, that we are starting today, but it should be a discussion that is not squeezed straight away fr into some boxes, like the one on commercial practices, or unfair terms, or information rights, What's needed is really rethinking, as it is mentioned in the agenda, the whole consumer law are key. It should be understood broadly and horizontally, and all the initiative should not be regarded as a kind of repair service where a little bit of here and there has to be adjusted. There is more needed. In our study, we were putting a digital vulnerability center stage which raises the question, what do we mean by digital vulnerability? Here, we are defining it as a universal state of defenselessness. A universal state of defenselessness and susceptibility to the exploitation of power imbalances as the result of the increasing automation of the commerce. Each of us is dispositionally vulnerable. And we need to rethink vulnerability as a concept in the consumer key as a whole. So far, vulnerability is defined as an exception to the rule. On the one hand, as the president said, we have this fantastic figure of the circumspect, responsible, omni, uh, omnipotent consumer who is able to digest all the information and make reasonable decisions and you know all this wonderful marketing language. Reality is different. In the reality we have, uh, at least in the rules on unfair commercial practices, we have some guidance of what vulnerability is, but it is regarded as the exception to the rule. So mental and physical infirmity, age, children and so on are issues. In practice, the distinction, and that's what the recent guidelines of the European Commission demonstrated in December 21, in practice, this particular vulner group of, vulner of vulnerable consumers is not, effect is not really subject to legal action by the enforcement authorities. So everything is focusing on the average consumer. If we go beyond now and if we leave the legal rules and the legal search, research behind and in we, if we move into legal philosophy, political science, behavioral science, communication, we find a huge amount of research that also in a way represent these two camps. On the one hand, those who argue like Feynman there is digital vulnerability on the others. There are those who say, no, 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 we have to distinguish. There are the responsible and the, uh, and the vulnerable ones, and we have to keep them distinct. Feynman, who is our intellectual hero, uh, argues that being vulnerable is essentially a consequence of the human embodiment. That means no ind individual can avoid vulnerability. It is part of our human condition. That is not just a particular group that can be singled out, but it concerns us all. If we go deeper now into this 
discussion of what digital vulnerability could mean, we can identify three distinct layers. And they are all coming from the outside, which is important. The first is the, the architectural side. The second is the relational, and the third is the datafied person. I will explain. With regard to architecture, think of, uh, of Thaler and Sunstein, Pasquale, Zuboff and others that have analyzed in detail how the design in the internet is <coughs> nudging us, pushing us into a particular direction. And let us not forget, the design means that we should buy something. It is a commercial exercise. There is a commercial interest behind the architecture. But as a normal person, we cannot understand it. If we are not a computer scientist and not really specialized, we cannot understand it. So this is the archi architecture. Then there is the relational element. Uh, and here, again, we refer to Feynman and to the embodiment, the human embodiment of vulnerability. So please remember, as a human being, we are not living alone. We are dependent on the social relations that we have around us. And this is also true in the digital environment because we are dependent on these relations and how do we compensate our vulnerability? We compensate it through trust. There's a lot of research in law and in all sorts of areas on these long-term relations that people are building Think in more concrete terms of our relationship to Google and Apple, the GAFAs or the GAMAs. We are building long-term relationship in that field like we do in finance and also in energy. So, psychologically, please be aware also that we talk of Google or Apple as if we are talking about a person. So we are personalizing something and that is our way to compensate our vulnerability, at least this is what the research tells us. The last element then is that this relation is data driven. I will not go into the details of what it means, but let me take myself as an example. So here I'm standing as Hans Micklitz and you may have your own impression of who I am. In the internet, each of us, like me, has an alter ego. And this alter ego is composed out of the information that I provided, but also out of proxies that uh, accomplish uh, my design, my behavioral design, that I'm a law professor and age and whatever, whatever you can, can find in the internet. So, the GAFAs have the capacity to collect the data and to build uh, this profile. Let me recall here one important point in practice and because the intention is to discuss and involve also the business side, that is important. In practice, the small and medium-sized business are to a large extent dependent on the data that the GAFAs provide and that they have to buy from the GAFAs uh, in order to be able to use them. So we have to keep this in mind when we look for consequences. And I will come back to this. So first of all, we propose to speak of, as lawyers, to speak of digital asymmetry. Why asymmetry? Very simple. The term vulnerability is a loaded concept in EU law. It is linked to these very narrow concepts of uh, mentally vulnerable people, handicapped, uh, the children, uh, the elderly, and so on. And that's why a new language has to be found, and I think the EU and the European Commission is extremely good in finding new catching language. Maybe there's a more catching one, but anyway. And then, this digital vulnerability, when we think of how to put it into legal language, it should be composed of the three elements, universal, architectural, and relational. What does it imply? So, as I said, and as the President said, we agree, 
current concept of fairness in the digital environment is not fit for purpose. There is the reliance on the average consumer and this reliance and the average consumer has to be demystified. It has to be brought closer to reality. The challenge that we have to face is how to bring the structural element, this architectural, relational, universal, how do we bring this into the consumer law archi? The first thing is we have to question and discuss seriously the limits of the information paradigm. We all know what it means to consent to something in the internet. It's just a misbelief to think that people are able to consent on something that we can overlook. The second is the whole consumer law archi has to be put and has to be put into question and has to be rethought so as to integrate, be able to integrate digital asymmetry as a concept. And then what will be the discussion in the, in the later stages of the day, then the enforcement dimension comes in. And here also in our study we have two proposals that might be uh, far-reaching, but in our understanding that's the only way to get out of the deadlock. The first is the reversal of the burden of proof of argumentation. Means that business has to demonstrate that they comply with the law and not the consumer has to demonstrate that there is an infringement of the law. That would mean that each company has to build the appropriate digital techniques and the technology. And here the differences between the small companies and the medium-sized companies and the uh, GAFAs come in that we have to consider. Because what the law should provide as a kind of benchmark that helps business to understand what they have to, what kind of evidence they have to provide they need to know standards, they need to have clear guidance, clear benchmark. The whole system of proposals and acts that is under revision or adopted is not legally very clear. It is broad language, it is more or less in the EU terminology, general requirements, statements that needs to be concretized and that should be done to technical standards. And I would like to draw the attention of the people sitting here to this underworld. It is not enough to look into the wonderful language that you can find in the EU directives and regulations. You need to look into the underworld, you need to look into the technical standards which are an integral part of the whole regulatory philosophy. To conclude, We hope that the digital fairness test offers an opportunity to open the box and to have this broad discussion and on how we can level up the consumer acquis. I think it's a wonderful uh, initiative and we should seize the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Very well said indeed. Now, I know we were at this point in time expecting Vice President Vastia, but traffic is Brussels traffic. So we're going to go straight on with Florencia and we'll, uh, we'll come to the Commissioner when she arrives. Thank you, Florencia. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm happy for traffic. <laughs> um, thanks very much for having me. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I, I'll be responding to Hans's uh, uh, comments and, and speak also about the topic of today. I have up some slides if you could put it up on. So I'll, I'll talk about the US perspective and I'll, I'll talk briefly about first the digital asymmetry uh, and vulnerability. So in, in the consumer law and, and US uh, contract law, asymmetry is, uh, is, is assumed because there's, there's, it's inherent in consumer transactions. Businesses are repeat players, consumers are less sophisticated, and as Hans explained, 
uh, there, there's situational vulnerability. We call it a symmetry of vulnerability, but the assumption is that consumers are at different times and at different kinds of transactions vulnerable. And for that reason, there is a si series of doctrines and laws that have been developed to address this asymmetry, particularly in the area of contract law, which is the area that I'm going to focus on, since a lot of these online uh, uh, interactions are based on contracts. Even privacy policies are contractual in nature, at least in the US. So, and it's, so this asymmetry is only exacerbated online. Fine print is everywhere, and it only increases, and also there's uh, bounded, uh, there, there's uh, shrouded attributes, there's a data component that sometimes it's, it's not the part of the visible um, aspect of the transaction. We, we think we're buying something, but we're also giving away our information, or when we're getting something for free, we're giving our, our data, and this is sometimes obscure, and consumers don't know about this. So, um, so we also have deceptive architecture, uh, such as uh, we call them dark patterns, and this again, makes consumers particularly vulnerable because they get manipulated into entering into transactions that they don't necessarily want. So can we keep going with that slide? So everyone is potentially vulnerable. So what, are, what is the, 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 the consumer protection regime that we have? If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the classic regulatory approach that we've had since the 70s, and we, and we very much see modern versions of it today at the core of consumer protection is disclosure or informed consent or smart disclosures. And, and the idea is that, um, is that there's an average or rational consumer who is only suffering from imperfect or asymmetric information and that this, that this uh, gap can be correcting, corrected by informing consumers by giving them more information. And this is the basis of the model, that we inform the consumer, the consumer can make welfare maximizing choices that reflect their particular preferences. What happens when, um, and of course, we don't assume that everyone's gonna become informed, but by lowering the cost of becoming informed, we arm a series of, a, a group of rational consumers who's big enough to discipline the market. So this idea <coughs> of the myth of the informed minority who's gonna discipline the market and, and, and take action for those of us who don't read. Well, all of this happens if this average consumer is teachable, but evidence has shown us that this is really not the case. So in some previous studies with co-authors, we found in a sample of over 50,000 consumers in real life transactions that only one in 1,000 access terms and only do so for 20 seconds, only enough to realize that they're in the wrong page, most likely. Um, uh, increased disclosure or mandating disclosure, if you could, yeah, there we go. Uh, doesn't really help either. It doesn't increase readership in any significant um, amount. Also, we find that contracts are complex, they grow, they become much longer, and they change frequently, thus making it impossibly hard for consumers to stay um, informed. And just bombarding consumers with pop-ups only creates clicking fatigue. It only gives us tendonitis, not much informed consent. So uh, the set of architecture further complicates this. So what do we do? Uh, one, one more slide, please. Um, so what we've done in the restatement of consumer uh, contracts is that we recognize, so the restatement just got uh, uh, passed, um, it, it recognizes the asymmetry of consumer transactions, especially online, and it articulates a series of protective techniques uh, that are employed by courts that in every single stage acknowledges this asymmetry and vulnerability of consumers and this imbalance. So next slide, please, thank you. So if you could just put all of them, I'll, I'll go through really quickly. So, so the first set of protective techniques talks about uh, formation and, and modification. So these are just a series of disclosures that, that keep in mind, that, that takes into account the totality of the circumstances, the entire presentation of terms, and, and takes into account the reasonable perspective or the perspective of a reasonable consumer in that particular transaction. So the perspective of the consumer even the vulnerable consumer is taken into account. We focus on, or courts focuses on the consumer, and then, but we acknowledge, and courts also acknowledge that formation is not enough, right? Disclosure is not enough. So there's these back-end protections that are supposed to protect the substance of the deal, police uh, against unfair terms, and also protect the reasonable expectations of consumers that many times are generated by businesses. Um, 
and so we have uh, unconscionability and deception, and then just other, other uh, enforcement tools that deal with the protection of the reasonable expectation of consumers. Uh, one more slide, being, being as quick as possible. And then another big issue is the enforcement problem, right? Uh, which we'll talk about later today. All of uh, enforcement of, of these transactions, which are negative expected value suit, why? Because an individual harm is not big enough uh, to merit the cost or bring an individual case, so they must be brought up as, cl as a class. These can be uh, uh, problematic if we have a lot of arbitration clauses and class action waiver clauses, which we saw as a result of a very um, seller-friendly decision on the U.S. Supreme Court, AT&T versus Concepcion. As a result, what courts have done is they focused on the, uh, on the ascent component of transactions, really making it very hard for contracts to be formed. What has this my, this uh, backfire is that it might actually legitimize assent and, and might lead courts not to focus on the substance of the transaction, which can be much more problematic. But the restatement seeks to address those particular uh, tools, and I'm happy to talk about more of that in the Q&A. And then finally, um, so the traditional disclosure regimes, in any shape or form, informed consent, which many of our modern regulations have, hopefully to some uh, lesser degree, are not effective. Why? Because this idea of the rational consumer who can be at all, at, at all times informed is just not sustainable. It's not, it's not supported by evidence and even by a little bit of introspection. Um, and so disclosure uh, re regulation and informed consent should give way to more effective policing techniques that focus on the substance of the deal, of course, without really halting progress. Uh, um, but maybe we should put to rest this wonderful idea that disclosure will solve all problems. And there's an important role of, of regulations, regulators, and we'll talk see later, the, the FTC, uh, state attorney generals, and, and other uh, regulatory tools. Thank you very much. <laughs>